This is Changeling, a play by Elaine Allen. This will be an audio play with just the actors' voices and stage directions read by the fabulous Vita Crew. The visuals for this video are mostly sketches of one possible set design, though there are some images that appear projected on the stage in the play which will appear on screen as well. The one-act version of this play was first performed by the Rude Mechanicals Theatre Ensemble out of Keene, New Hampshire in June of 2014, with the first production of the two-act version performed by the same two years later in July of 2016. Many of the original cast members from those two productions return for this audio version. Changeling does feature some lines of poetry from classic poems about fairies. Sources will be listed in the video description and in the credits. This production was directed by Jasmine Carroll and Elaine Allen. And with that, I present Changeling. Act 1, Scene 1. A playground on the edge of town, a little run down, but more from use than lack of care. To the side, circling around the edges of the playground, as if beginning to swallow it, a forest looms. This is not the sparse copse of trees that one sees in most neighborhood parks. This is dark and tangled, impenetrable to any but those that run on four legs. In the playground, the swing waves gently in a breeze. As the wind whispers through the trees, it almost sounds like music, piping, haunting, lovely. It is twilight. It will be the night of the new moon and the first night of the wild hunt. The darkness seems to seep from the forest. A soccer ball bounces onto the stage. A creature, the hinky punk, dashes out of the woods to catch the ball, examines it like it is something it has never seen before, and considers stealing it. Out of bounds! Oh, come on! You suck! A wild one from Jacob's! The voices startled the hinky punk back into the woods where it watches the rest of the scene. A boy, Jaden, enters, chasing the ball. He is 15 and blonde. I'll get it. He grabs the ball and pauses, staring into the forest. Unexpected and unexplainable lights have caught his eye. Come on, Jay! Just throw it! What are you doing? Get your mind in the game! Jaden throws the ball back but does not follow. The sounds of a rousing soccer game drift onto the stage. After a moment of staring into the forest, Jaden gets ready to run back to the game but stops as a dark figure steps out from the forest. She is wearing a white dress and there is something welcoming about her, but her skin is faintly green, like something that died and drifted below the surface of the water for too long. Come, my love. I'm sorry, who are you? Follow me to my pool. Swimming? It's like December. It's gonna snow tomorrow. Everything will be fine. Warm as summer sunshine. Well, I mean... But who are you again? You will slip with me into warm liquid light. And I will keep you afloat. She turns. Where are you going? I th thought I was going with you. Come to the water and bathe, my love. Come swim in the swirling pool. Jenny puts out a hand. It is skeletally long and a rotting blue-green. Jaden takes it and follows her into the forest. A moment later, the soccer ball bounces back on stage. Hey, Jaden, can you get that for us? Jay, where'd you go? An empty stage with the soccer ball swaying gently in the breeze. Lights fade as the hinky punk returns, sniffs the ball, and runs off with it into the forest. Scene two. The playground the next day. Davi is walking Finnegan home from school. They pause in the playground to chat and hang around. They are too old to play, but are still drawn to the jungle gym and swings. Did you see that thing on the news last night? Do you think I've got nothing better to do than watch the local news? I don't know, Sally Spathers has a certain flair for the dramatic. This is Sally Spathers, and that is all. The news. She thinks she's Barbara Walters. But last night, they were doing this thing on some stuff that happened, like back in the 70s. This thing on some stuff? Shut up. So, Mom made me go to bed before it was over, but it was all about these kids that went missing, like four or five of them. 
Yeah, and? Like, right here. They all disappeared from right around this playground. Yeah, and? And they were never heard from again. The cops couldn't figure out what had happened to them. They sent out search dogs to, you know, sniff them out. And the trail always disappeared out there in the forest just past here. So what? Were they ever found? I don't know. Like I said, Mom didn't let me stay up to see the end. Seriously? I've gotta Google it. Turns to go. You know, there were some pictures and stuff with parental advisories. And your mom let you watch? Like I said, no. She sent me to bed before it got really good. You don't think I usually have a bedtime, do you? What did you see? It was sort of hard to figure out. They were all in this little teaser preview thing before, but they looked like some hella old bodies, like shriveled up and dry with vines and grass growing all over them, like some freaky mummies. So the kids were killed? I don't know. Maybe. But maybe those were just the pictures that Sally Smathers thought would get people to watch. What's supposed to have killed them? I don't know. Do you want to explore? The forest? No, I'm, I'm good. Why not? It's just dumb trees. I'm going home. Do you, like, want to come over? My mom got pizza rolls, and we could Google those lost kids. I bet they have the pictures online. Okay. But first, let's see if we can find anything in the dumb trees. Well, alright, but we have to be back by dark. I didn't bring a flashlight. The kids move toward the forest, but just when they are stepping into the shadows of the trees, another teenager comes running into the playground. Finnegan, your mom is freaking. You have to get home now. Probably you too, Davi. What? Why? What did I do? It's not that. Jaden Thompson went missing last night. There are police everywhere, and after they came to my house, my mom told your mom, and she was like, oh my god, where is Finnegan? And I was like, I don't know, probably off with Dobby. And my mom sent me to find you before your mom has a complete heart attack on our kitchen floor. And your mom is okay with you wandering around alone. <laughs> wow, Finn, you're as bad as my mom. It's just around the corner, and I've got my cell phone and that pepper spray my dad got me last year for my trip to the city. Okay, okay, I'm coming. So what happened? I don't know. We were playing soccer yesterday, and he was just gone. We all thought he had just gone home. The two kids are gone. Davi glances apprehensively at the forest before following. As soon as they are off, a woman steps out of the shadow of a tree where she has been hiding all along. She is just a hair too tall to be natural, but beautiful and faintly terrifying. As she turns, we see her back is hollow. Run away home, little babes, to your warm beds. Dream of magic and danger, heroes and monsters. Dream of me. She follows across the stage and the lights fade to blackout. As she moves, will-o'-wisps begin to glow, following the children home. Scene three. Lights up on a classroom. It is near the end of the school day. Mr. Shifra is teaching. There is a girl at the front of the room just finishing a presentation. She flips through a PowerPoint projected on the board behind her, showing images of the bell tower and early pictures of the town. So when the bell tower was built in 1854, it like made all the papers nearby because it was the only freestanding, like not attached to a church, bell tower in five counties. It was also really weird because it was this huge building project, like only a year after the town was founded. And like the town hall, the church and the jail and half the houses hadn't even been finished yet. And they had already spent like $3,000 on raising the hill where they were going to build the old library, which would be like a million dollars now. But instead of finishing anything, the town council had this giant bell tower built on the far side of town. I know it's like in the middle of town now, but everything that's around it was built in the 1870s. So like, I couldn't find any articles from the local paper explaining why it got built first, but there is this little plaque above the bell that says, May the silver chimes protect our community. Which, I mean, I thought it was weird, so I looked it up on Wikipedia, and it seems that bells used to be believed to protect against evil spirits. 
my nan says that that sort of superstition used to be very big around here and that's why most of the old houses have horseshoes nailed above the door and why there are all those rowan trees planted around the edge of the park and yeah so that's what i found on the bell tower Thank you for going first, Marissa. I hope you are all taking notes, because I will be compiling a test from all of your reports on local history for next week. And more importantly, this project is not about proving that you can read 40-year-old newspapers. I know you can do that. Remember, this assignment is about discovering the way history relates to you. History is not something that happened in some moldy old book or epic poem something that was the everyday life of your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. Uh, but, Mr. Shifra, um, my family's from California, though. There are more ways to connect to history than blood, Andrew. When you are working on your reports, which you should be almost through with at this point, might I remind you, I want you looking for the ways this stuff affects your life. Maybe your parents did not grow up here, and so will not appear in any of your local histories. But there is a reason that they moved here. If you're lost, look into that. The reason will lead you to this community's history. Now, tomorrow we will be hearing from Davi on the Summer Ice Cream Festival, Caitlin on the McDougal Farm, Liam on Hyde Street Park, and Finnegan on the Fire of 1973. Actually, Mr. Shifra, I've sort of changed what I will be talking about. Yes. Where has your research taken you? Well, I was going to talk about the kids that disappeared around then. The bell rings. The class begins to rise, gather their stuff, and leave. And there's the bell. Everyone remember the presentation we had this morning with Officer Daniels? If you're walking home, go with a group. Go straight home. Don't talk to strangers and keep your cell phones charged and on you. Don't be nervous if you see more police cars. They are there to keep you safe. And Finnegan, if I could speak with you a moment before you go. I'll wait by the vending machines, Finn. Don't worry about it. Go on. Your mom will freak if you're late again. But- Finnegan is right, Davi. Go with the rest of the group. I'll make sure that Finnegan gets home safely. Um, well, we, we usually walk together. Go on. You can walk with the others. Michael and Jessa won't eat you. It's not me that I'm worried about. They leave. So, Finnegan, you want to talk about the 1973 disappearances. Yeah, it came up when I was looking into the fire and just... Well, it seems really interesting. And? And you were talking about looking for how history relates to our lives, and well, I thought... And you thought that with Jaden missing, there would be nothing more pertinent. Yes, but it's not just that. Everything is exactly the same. When those kids went missing, it was December, like it is now. They were all the same age as Jaden. They all went missing after being seen in or around the forest. They were all blonde. Even the way the newspapers describe those kids sounds like Jaden. They were all, like, talking about how special, how talented those kids were. Like, there were those two violin players, and that one kid had just won a national award for his writing. And Jaden plays the guitar, like, insanely well. It's all the papers can talk about, just like it was back in the 70s. Yes, well, I wouldn't read too much into that. When children go missing, we all tend to think about how special they were. Are. And the rest? The same time of year? The same hair color? The same age? I can't say. Maybe it is a pattern. Maybe it is coincidence. But either way... This is not about how sound your thesis is. I'm I'm not sure it's a good idea to bring this up in class. But we just had the chief of police in here giving us a lesson on how to keep ourselves safe. Whether your classmates are obvious about it or not, they're upset about Jaden. We're all upset about Jaden. Think about how those cases in the 70s turned out. Tam never showed up at all. Bridget and Blair, well, bodies were found in that forest that authorities agree were probably theirs, though they were too degraded to be identified. And Stephen's body was identified by his parents. Did you know them? No, well, I moved to the area only a few years ago, but I must admit that I have been interested in the case, too. I've seen the pictures and read the police reports, which is why I'm going to ask you to do the report you had originally planned 
on the fire. But if you would like, you can write up a report on what you have learned about the disappearances instead, but I do not want you presenting it to the class. But I thought the presentation was a large part of our grade. One of the main reasons was to determine your level of engagement with the project, and whether you have really absorbed the information or not, you clearly have. And if anything, you're too interested in this rather morbid topic. I don't want you to waste the work you've clearly done, but I cannot in good conscience let you talk about this in class. Now come on, we'll check to see if you've missed your walking groups, and if you have, we'll give you a ride home. You don't have to. I can walk. By yourself? I think not. You should know how dangerous that can be. It's okay. I can walk with him. Tavi, I thought I told you to go on ahead with the others? Yeah, but I thought I could save you the drive and walk with Finn. Okay? Sure. Let's head out. Your mom's going to flip. They leave. Mr. Schieffer remains, sitting on his desk, watching the door. After a moment, he pulls a file out from his desk, flipping through the pages inside. The stage fades to black, but behind him we see projected on the screen a series of missing posters. Jaden, Stephen, Blair, Bridget, and finally Tam. Mr. Schieffer turns to look at the projection behind him. It fades to black. Scene four. Once again, Davi and Finnegan linger in the playground on their way home. A quarter moon rises. I don't think you should have stayed with Mr. Shifra. Are you kidding? He's our teacher. What was I supposed to say? No? What did he want? I thought you were listening in. He wanted to talk about my history project. He thinks it's too morbid to present to the class. Well, yeah, but alone? When everyone else is going straight home. Jesus, he's just a history teacher. I don't know. It just seems creepy with Jaden missing. He's been gone almost a week, and you know the police were talking to Mr. Schieffer the other day. The police talked to all our teachers, and the librarians, and the convenience store clerks, and the guys at the skate park, and the neighbors, and most of us. Well, yeah, but- Did you see that? See what? We should go. Don't be stupid. It's just an animal or something. Like a deer but bigger. My mom says there aren't any deer around here anymore. She says unlicensed hunting wiped them out in the 70s, along with all the other natural fauna of the region. She says there's nothing left in these woods but feral dogs and raccoons, and it's our voracious overconsumption that is to blame. Well, your mom is a bit granola, isn't she? Ooh, you'll think this is cool. Did you know that the Native Americans around here wouldn't even set foot in these woods? They said they were sacred. My mom says there was supposed to be some hill where the spirits lived around here. Seriously? That's weird. Walking towards the forest. I saw a deer. Finn, it's getting dark already. My mom, granola or not, is going to kill me if I'm not home soon. Then let's go. Takes another step towards the woods. There was something in Times a couple weeks ago about the resurgence of white-tailed deer. Finn, come on. Whatever it was, it's run off by now. No, it's still there. It's bigger than a deer. I don't see it. Your mom's not going to be too happy either. Come on. I want a picture. If we move slow enough, I bet we can get closer. As Finnegan takes another step forward, the wind whips up suddenly, shaking the trees that encroach on the edge of the playground. An unearthly sound, like a whinny if horses were half a dinosaur, <laughs> cuts through the park and Davi bolts. Finnegan is frozen like a mouse before a snake staring into the woods. Davi, realizing Finnegan did not follow, runs back, grabs his arm, and pulls him away, running for home. The sky opens up, thunder rolls, and a storm rolls over the playground. As lightning crashes, we hear the sound of hooves pounding the ground, and a large equine shadow bolts across the stage, chasing the kids. The shadow has red eyes. Blackout. Scene 5. The next day at school, Finnegan stands at the front of the class with a PowerPoint displayed on the board behind him. He is mid-report. There is a map on the PowerPoint. And the firefighters declared the buildings east of Broad Street, like, totally unsavable. 
They stopped trying to fight the fire and just sprayed down the surrounding buildings. They built a firewall, which didn't have to do with computers. It was like an actual wall that was supposed to stop the flames. And they just let the library and the six houses on the forest side burn. You can see here that School Street used to extend another block into the forest, but it was still dirt at that point. And after the fire, there was like no one going down that way. So the grass grew up over it and you can barely even tell it was a road anymore. So like, these are pictures of what the library used to look like from the 60s and then what it looks like now, all burned and empty. And here's the big house at the end of School Street. And this one is out past that. It seems that the town used to, like, in the 30s, have an old town hall and more houses even further back in the forest. The old streets actually extend pretty far, though they're really hard to find now. Except when you, like, <laughs> trip over the old stone foundations. When I first found them, I assumed they were from the fire, but... Only three houses were burned, and these are older, and not all ashy like the ones from the fire. So I Finnegan, how did you get these photos? I took them myself. Tell me you didn't go into the forest by yourself. Well, no. Davi went with me. But, like, before Jaden went missing. Before you even assigned this project. That's why I wanted to study the fire. I wanted to know what all those ruins were. You should not be wandering around the forest, especially now. Did you have any more information to share with us about the fire? Um, yeah. Just that they still don't know what set the fire. Reports indicated that it was definitely arson. But no one was ever arrested or even questioned, which I thought was weird considering that over an acre of forest burned, though you can barely tell where it was now. And with the discovery of the body- Finnegan. The bell rings, the student rise and leave. Finnegan, a moment, please. Finnegan stays, so does Dobby. Finnegan, I'm serious about you staying away from the forest. Mr. Shifra, I was telling the truth. I haven't been in the woods since, like, a month before Jaden disappeared. It's true, Mr. Schieffer. We took those pictures back in October. Do not lie to me. But look at the timestamp on the picture. It was, like, the week before Halloween. We were talking about setting up a haunted trail, so Davi and I- Finnegan- Goes to desk and turns back a slide on the PowerPoint. There's snow in this photo. But- What? You know- as well as I do, that it did not snow until the day after Jaden went missing. Explain to me how your photos, taken in October, have snow in them. That's not right. There was no snow in that picture yesterday. In response, Mr. Shifra flips through the slideshow again. All of the current pictures show snow. Finnegan is speechless. The two of you go home now. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go home. I will be calling your parents to discuss this. Finnegan and Davi slink away. Mr. Shifra turns to look at the PowerPoint. The lights fade, but before the projection disappears, we see in the back of photo what looks like a large black horse with red eyes stepping into frame. <laughs> Scene 6. The Playground. A group of girls walk by on the way home from school. And I said to my mom, you can't really expect me to be in bed by 9 o'clock. This whole curfew thing is just going to their heads. Like my brother says, just because we have to be home by dark doesn't mean we're like 5 years old again. Your brother is like 5 years old. You're like 5 years old. One girl stops to tie her shoe. <laughs> That's real mature. Laura, are you coming? I'm right behind you, just fixing my shoe. The other girls leave. Laura is alone on stage when the wind picks up and pulls papers out of her backpack. Oh crap, get back here. She chases her papers across the playground. She pulls up short before hitting the forest and backs away staring at something. Hello? 
Who's there? Jaden? A creature steps out of the forest. It looks like Jaden, but it's not. It is the Gankana. Its feet are backwards on its legs. We must not look at goblin men. We must not buy their fruits. Who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots? Oh my god, are you kidding me? Where have you been? The entire town is panicked. Your parents are freaked. What are you, what are you- Stalking closer to her, unseen by Laura, shadowy figures slink out of the woods, moving to circle her, growing ever closer. Come by, call the goblins, hobbling down the glen. Jaden? Oh, cried Lizzie. Laura, Laura, you should not peep at goblin men. The shadow figures engulf her, blanketing her in darkness before the lights black out. Scene 7. Lights up on Mrs. Brennan serving a good old-fashioned tea with bread and butter. A grandmotherly figure, she sits knitting or sewing in a rocking chair. Finnegan sits across from her, awkwardly sipping from a china teacup. Now, you said over the phone that you wanted to talk to me for a class? Yeah, I mean, yes ma'am. As I was saying, I'm doing a project on local history. I've looked at all the old newspapers, but I have some questions, and I got your phone number online. And, well, I was wondering, I mean, I'm working on... Yes, love? I'm studying the disappearances from the 70s. Ah, yes. I was just talking to that nice lady from the news. Did you see the report? Not on TV, but I looked it up on YouTube. It was, well, not very big on information. No, it wasn't. A shame. Maybe if they had really told the story, those two children wouldn't have disappeared. Did you know that, Jaden? Or Laura? But what is a nice young person like you doing studying this kind of thing? I don't know. It's for extra credit. Do you think that Jaden and Laura's disappearances have anything to do with your daughter? Mrs. Brennan gets up and picks up a framed photo. She offers it to Finnegan. Here she is, my Bridget. Your daughter, Bridget, was... Was taken, yes. Taken? I thought they never figured out what happened to the kids. They were taken. We all knew it, but as Miss Bathers reminded me two weeks ago, this is not the sort of thing you put on the news. So, what happened to your daughter? <clears throat> the same thing that happened to all the children. The people of the forest took them, just as they are doing now, just as they did in the 30s. Of course, in 33, they took 12, where we only lost four. Thank the Lord for the fire. Wait, this happened in the 30s, too? And 40 years before, and 40 years before that, since the first settlers put down roots on the edge of this forest. That can't be true. It's historical fact, though most of the details have been lost. When the library burned, all the old records were lost. But before the fire, I read a newspaper article from 33 that talked about the 12 lost that year and the seven children that disappeared in 1893. I don't remember their names now, but they were so like my Bridget. But what happened to them? As I said, they were taken by the people in the forest. Every 40 years, the kindly folk take their tithes. They don't sound so kind. Quiet, child. We do not speak of the good neighbors. Do not draw their eyes. I don't understand. Who are the good neighbors? Shh. The old woman rises, fetching a candle from a table and lighting it. She takes a glass of water, and dipping her fingers in the water, she flicks the water across the top of the flame, muttering the Lord's Prayer under her breath. Uh, what are you doing? Do not speak of them. But who are they? Dinya she, the fair folk. You mean fairy? Quiet. To call them by name is to invite their attention, especially now. But if kids were disappearing every 40 years, why didn't everyone just move away? Some did. This town is smaller now than it was in the 1920s. 
and it was smaller then than it was in the late 1800s. I'm sure you've seen the streets that disappear into the forest. That's where the original settlers built. They raised the hill and cleared almost a hundred acres of trees for farmland and building. According to the old stories, the trees grew back within three years, sometimes straight through the houses. By the 1870s, they were already abandoning the original settlement, and everything new was built to the east, away from the shadow of the forest. I've never heard about any of this. Of course not, dear. No one talks about the people in the forest. Everyone would think they were insane. In the 30s, they blamed the influenza. With Bridget, Tam, and the others, the papers just reported the disappearances without ever mentioning what could have happened to the children. But we knew. Then the library burned. The bodies were found, and the disappearances stopped. You think the fire was what ended it? It burned them out. No one ever told you these stories? When I was a child, we spent every Sunday listening to our grandparents and the old church ladies. We knew to stay away from still water, where Jenny Greenteeth lurked, waiting to drown us. We knew to not follow the will-o'-wisps along the trails at night. We knew not to whistle after dark, and to wear our clothing inside out. We knew that any strange horse might be a puka waiting to carry us to our deaths. When the tower bells rang in warning, we ran home. And we knew that any child left alone or overlooked could be stolen and replaced with a changeling. Changeling? Listen well, child. There is truth in the old stories, and living here, you must know them. We never caught her after the fire, but my sister. She was born in early December, 1933. She was a strange child growing up. Temperamental, disobedient, cruel, ill at ease inside of the church. She never seemed to fit with the other children. We were all surprised when she married straight out of high school and showed up pregnant almost immediately. But the baby did not make it. She had seven miscarriages across nearly ten years before Tam was born. Now he was a sweet baby. Barely ever cried, always smiling. He grew up with the sweetest singing voice, and my sister barely even looked at him. After so many years obviously trying to have a child, when she had one, she seemed not to want it. She ignored him as much as she could, so I raised him with my daughter, Bridget, who was born the same year. That's him there, in the picture next to her. The Tam that disappeared? Well, you're not likely to meet two. They were the first to disappear. First Tam, and then my Bridget. From the day Tam went missing, Bridget swore he was in the forest. I assumed his mother had said something to upset him, and he had run away. It had happened before. He spent a few nights sleeping in the library or the school, but he had always come home. I think Bridget went out looking for him. It wasn't until Blair went missing as well that people realized it wasn't just family problems. When Stephen didn't come home from school, well, we knew they weren't coming back. I'm sorry for your loss. Losses. You're a sweet child too, aren't you? My sister disappeared the same night as Stephen. Her husband came home early from work and could not find her anywhere. Of course, as soon as he showed up at the police station yelling about her being missing, they sent out the tracking dogs. Her trail ended in the forest, right in front of the library. Head librarian had even seen her standing in the front garden, which in itself was not odd. She worked there as a children's librarian, but she had been singing. According to him, she sang until a boy, Stephen, came walking up. She took his hand and they just disappeared. Poor Mr. O'Malley. He thought he was going insane. You think your sister took the children? No, dear. I think it was not my sister. It had not been my sister for years, but whatever it was, it took the children. The fire was started in the trees behind the library that night. The thing that was not my sister never returned. And when the disappearances ended, we all knew. What happened to the rest of the family? Oh, her husband pined away, drank himself to death, and Tam was their only child. That's so awful. It was. But it was 40 years ago now. I am more concerned with the children that vanished last week and the ones that will keep vanishing until the wild hunt ends. I tried to tell that Miss Spathers from the TV station, but she thought I was crazy. <laughs> 
As do you, probably. Well, I need to be getting home. Thank you for your time, Mrs. Brennan. But your mother is not here yet, love. Yeah, but I live just up the street. It's okay. I can walk. I can drive you, dear. No, really. It's fine. I'll be home in like five minutes. And my mother doesn't let me ride in the car with strangers. Especially now. Well, all right. But call me as soon as you get home to tell me you made it. And please, take this. She offers Finnegan a small loaf of bread from the tea tray. Um, thank you, but I'm not hungry. It's not to eat, love. It's a fairy loaf. Keep it in your pocket and it will keep your eyes clear of their glamours. Their magic won't be able to fool you. Okay. He takes it. And let me get you a horseshoe. A good luck charm? No, dear, the iron. They can't touch it. You know, I think I will call if I have any more questions. So, thanks. Finnegan quickly heads towards the door. A worried Mrs. Brennan calls one more bit of advice as he runs out. And make sure you are home before the moon rises. Tonight's the full moon, so the kindly folk will be out hunting for sure. Blackout. Scene 8. The playground. The sun is setting and it is dark. Though a full moon already peeks out through the trees, there is something foreboding, threatening about the forest in the moonlight and the shapes of the shadows cut across the ground. The hinky punk stands under the jungle gym, clearly waiting for someone. Seeing someone coming, it scampers into the forest. Finnegan rushes across the playground alone on his way home. He pauses halfway across the space and turns toward the forest. Insane. The lady's crazy. Not that I blame her. I didn't know that she had lost not just a daughter, but her nephew and sister too. And it really sounds like her sister probably killed those kids. Who wouldn't want to blame it on fairies? Will-o'-wisp lights flash in the edge of the forest. Finnegan sees them and makes a point of looking away. A soccer ball bounces on stage, and from the forest we hear a mean-spirited snicker. <laughs> But then again, she's not the one talking to an empty playground. A voice cuts across the empty playground. Come away, O oh human child, to the woods and waters wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Finnegan turns to Bolt. He runs but slams into a figure that steps out of the shadows. Take a breath, Finnegan. It's me. What are you doing here? I live right there. I saw you walking alone at night by the forest. Didn't anyone warn you? The forest is dangerous. Yeah, you. Every day for the past two weeks. And when you dropped me off at the old... at Mrs. Brennan's house. That's why I'm going home. How about you let me drive you? How about you let me walk? I'll be home in like five minutes. Won't your mother be angry when you walk in so late? Well, yeah, but I, um... Come on, Finnegan. Come with me. He holds out a hand and steps into the forest. Finnegan follows, not realizing they are going the wrong way. Finnegan! From behind him, Mr. Schieffer's voice precedes him onto the stage. Do not follow that man! He's not me! What? There are two of you! That man is not me. What do you mean? Who is he? A Gankana. And what the hell is that? A monster. Come with me. Hurry. A I'll get you monster? home. monster? How cruel. And pleasant is the fairy land, but an eerie tale to tell. Finish the quote, Gankana. At the end of every seven years, we pay a tithe to hell. The creature steps back out from the forest. It looks like Laura. I am so fair and firm of flesh, I'm feared it be myself. Laura? No, Finnegan, look at her feet. It's still the Gankana. Her feet are backwards! How is that even possible? You're not human. I should hope not. You're not a... I mean, are you a fairy? It crosses through a shadow, and when he steps out the other side, he looks like Jaden. 
Oh, Finnegan, you do seem determined to find us. Finnegan, please. We have to escape while we can. He pulls him away from the playground, trying to make good his escape. Finnegan resists. Why? I only have your word that it's dangerous. It hasn't tried to do anything to either of us. Yes, what have I done to you? What about Jaden and Laura? Did you do something to them? Of course I did not. Then what happens to them? Frowning, the Gancana raises a hand. Out of the forest drifts ethereal, haunting music. Mr. Shifra stops in his tracks. Finnegan, please come with me. You can run, but he will not. He's not our usual type, but since he's just so determined... Hey! What's that supposed to mean? Finnegan, you will stay with me, right? Um, sure. I mean, not for long. I have to get home or my mother will kill me, but... The music is getting louder, more distinct. Desperate, Mr. Schieffer pulls Finnegan away from the Gancana, who smiling lets him. Finnegan resists, but Mr. Schieffer is stronger than him. They are almost off stage when a shadow rises up from the ground in front of them. Mr. Schieffer sees it and jolts back. Finnegan cannot see it. Jesus, Mr. Schieffer, what are you doing? Yes, Mr. Schieffer. What are you doing? Are you sure you can trust him? Finnegan, they're going to try to get you into the forest. No matter what you do, do not go. How do you know any of this? Yes, Tam. How do you know so much about us? Tam? His name's not Tam. It was. But like, the Tam that disappeared? You can't be that Tam. He would be over 50 years old. Time passes differently under Hill. The Lian Shi steps out of a shadow. And now you've come home. Mr. Schieffer panics. He turns to run, but trips over Finnegan. <laughs> come to me, my love. We'll dance in the light of the new moon, and sleep in the warm winter grass, and swim in the desert rain, and you will be mine forever. As she speaks, shadows swarm from the forest, encircling Mr. Shifra. They pull him to his feet and slowly toward the forest. I do not belong to you. Oh, my little love. Yes, you do. You have been mine since the day you followed me into the forest. She looms over him. Then with a swirl of shadow cloak, they are both gone along with all the shadows, leaving Finnegan and the Gancana alone in the playground. Mr. Shifra! What are you going to do with him? I am not going to do anything with him. But where is she taking him? Why don't you come and see? No, just tell me where you're taking him. Put him out of your mind. Now, are you ready to come with me? Finnegan starts to take his hand, but then backs away. I need to be headed home. Yes, you do, Finnegan. Take my hand and follow me under hill to the fairyland you've dreamt of. Eternal starlight, trees made of crystal, grass as green as emeralds, the richest nectars the world has ever tasted, and air that smells of sunshine, a world built for the sole purpose of beauty and built well, inhabited by creatures as beautiful as the world, more attractive than any you will ever find over hill, Tall and strong, elegant and sweet, they will fawn over you, treat you like the gift you are, and you will be at the center of it all. I can't. I'm offering you magic, Finnegan. Fairies and elves, beasts and dragons, enchantment and eternity. You will be young forever, our human child, spoiled and beloved. Come with me into the forest, and you will never have to share our love. He is near Finnegan, reaching out to touch him. Finnegan backs away. What happened to Jaden and Laura? We took them away from their hopeless human world and showed them the magic hidden just beneath the surface. You killed them. They're dead, aren't they? Just like those kids in the 70s. What makes you think those children died? They found bodies. I've seen the pictures. You've seen pictures of bodies, true. What made you think they were the children? But- But, but, but. That's all you ever say. Think of what I'm offering you. What is the one thing you've always wished for in your life? Magic. An adventure. A great big danger that only you can defeat. You're dangerous? 
Shadows come forward encircling him. They lift quickly to reveal a creature unlike any Finnegan has seen before. It is ghastly, all elongated features, sharp teeth and horns. If you want me to be... The shadows mask him again, replacing him with the not Laura shape. Or I can be a friend. Replaces him with the not Mr. Shifra. Or a benevolent mentor. Replaces him with the not Jaden. Or I can be... Stop! What was that? What are you? I will give you everything you have ever wanted. Follow me under hill, and all the kingdoms in the world will be yours. And if I say no? You'll come with me. But... Shadowy figures and creatures are creeping out of the forest. But, 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 but. Finnegan backs away. Come, my love. Come to us. Finnegan, come. Come to us. Come. 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 Come to us. Last chance. Say yes now, or I'll eat you up. They swarm over the Gankana, and when they continue on past him, he is gone. Finnegan does not notice. He is frozen. Mr. Shifra comes running from forest. Finnegan! Run! He tries to, but pulls up short. There are shadowy figures behind him as well. I can't! Mr. Shifra, what do I do? This way. We can cut through the edge of the forest and- The forest? I can get you out of here. Finnegan starts to run towards him, but something drops out of his pocket. It is the loaf of bread that Mrs. Brennan foisted on him. He leans down to pick it up. Your feet are backward. Are you sure it's not yours? Finnegan runs, pushing through the line of shadows. The shadows swarm to follow. In the darkness left on stage, the Gankana remains, smiling. It was murk, murk night. There was no starlight. They waded through red blood to the knee, for all the blood that's shed on the earth rinse through the springs of that country. Blackout. Act Two, Scene One. Shifra, standing at the window of his house, drinking a mug of tea. The sun is setting. A full moon shines over the forest. A full moon. We're halfway through. Oh, see ye not yon narrow road, so thick beset with thorns and briars? That is the path of righteousness, though after it but few inquire. And see ye not yon broad, broad road that lies across the lily leaven? That is the path of wickedness, though some call it the road to heaven. While he speaks, the Lian Shi appears outside his window. Though Shifra sees her, he continues calmly. And see ye not yon bonny road that winds about the ferny bray? That is the road to fair Elfland, where thou and I this night may go. But, Thomas, ye shall hold your tongue, whatever ye may hear or see. For speak ye word in elven land, you'll ne'er win back your own country. Hello, my little love. You are not welcome here. This is my home, not yours. Then why call me love? I did not call you. And there he saw a lady bright come riding down by Elden Tree. I was just remembering the poem, not calling anyone. I used to read those poems to you as you lay at night in your bed. But whatever you say, I suppose I'll go. I have someone to meet. She turns to leave. I don't suppose there's any point in demanding you give the children back. <laughs> Do you wish to make a bargain, little love? Would you trade yourself for them? No, it hardly matters. We both know they're dead. Are they? Do not play with me. <laughs> Why would we kill the little lost larks? Revenge? Pure sadism? Because you can? I've never pretended to understand the ways monsters think. Do not be mean, my love. I'm not the one killing children. It's hardly personal. Just the repayment for our hill. 
This petty town was so quick to agree back when they planted their houses over the bones of our forest. Happy to trade a few little lost larks for their safety. They couldn't have known. Really, love? You read the contract before the library burned. You were the one that found it amongst the old maps. Didn't you take it to school? Wrote a book report on it, I believe. <laughs> and so I know good and well. It was far from fair. You were threatening to raise the entire town. Not I. You know what I mean. You're kind. You're kind, love. I still can't believe they would willingly sign something that gave you that much free reign. To sign something that meant that every generation would lose children. Everyone who ever lived in this damn town would know at least one stolen child. Oh, little love, do you still pine for your little family? Yours too. Not my blood. I really thought it would stop after the library burned. Well, that's your fault. What? Because of your little book report. The contract wasn't in the library when it burned. Where is it? No, it's for the better, isn't it? At least with the contract, the town is safe most of the time. And you judge them for agreeing in the first place? My love, why do you insist on staying here? Come away with me. This is my home. It always has been. Your home is with me. Come, you will not be alone tonight. What? Do you mean that Jaden or Laura are still alive? Who knows? No. You mean something else. Someone else. You plan to take another child tonight. The moon is not yet new. We have another fortnight to take those we can. Who? Oh, who do you think? Who is the little nightingale that wanders our trails, searching for the stories hidden in each shadow? Who asks after us? Who spends as much time in the new library as you spent in the old? Lian Shi. Not our usual type, but he would make a good little pet. Who? Thank you for your help, love. What help? Right before the hunt, you charge the children with learning their town's history, hoping they will find out about us. You send them to search the places the children meet the woods. You give them enough information to drive their curiosity. You went to the homes of the special children, so we would know where to find our favorites. You have been quite helpful. I did not. I warned Jaden and Laura's parents that the children could be in danger. I never helped you, and never will. <laughs> of course you will. You are mine. Why else would you come back here to play at humanity? You even helped us tonight. You delivered our new pet to your aunt's house at the edge of the forest. The house you helped us take Bridget from. Finnegan. Of course. Oh, God, I was just trying to teach them how to protect themselves. And you are doing so well. Until seven years were gone and passed, true Thomas on earth was never seen. <laughs> Finnegan should be starting his walk home now. She is gone. Shifa runs out, heading for the park. Scene two. The next morning, the classroom, students are streaming in. Davi is already at their desk looking nervous. Finnegan rushes in, clearly running late. Oh my god! Finnegan, I was worried sick! Where were you last night? You sound like my mother. Well, why shouldn't I? She called five times last night in a panic. I was just waiting for the cops to show up. What happened? I visited Mrs. Brennan about my report, and she was really weird. It freaked me out, so I left early and walked home. You walked home? No wonder your mom flipped, with Jaden and Laura missing? It was fine. W weren't you freaked? Well, yeah. I got freaked out. The bell rings, interrupting the conversation. Mr. Shifra enters the classroom and sees Finnegan. They both look surprised to see each other. They both make the obvious decision not to say anything. 
just do me a favor and stay away from Mr. Shifra. But what happened? What did you see? Quiet down now. We have a lot to do today. If you could get your homework ready for collection. And there I dreamed. Ah, woe betide. The latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hillside. Finnegan? Nothing, Mr. Shifra. <clears throat> All right, then. We're having another assembly today. Mr. Marshall would like to discuss the most recent evidence in Jaden and Laura's disappearance. Oh, what can ail thee, knight-at-arms, so haggard and so woe-begone? We will be losing ten minutes off of each period, and five off of home room, so we don't have much time together today. I see a lily on thy brow with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose, fast withereth too. Finnegan, silence, please. I will see you in fourth period today, and I will have your homework ready to return to you by then. Sam, we will be hearing your presentation on the new library this afternoon, and I hope that this time your computer files are not mysteriously corrupted. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. What are you doing, Finnegan? It's just a poem. Save it for English class, Finnegan. Of course, Mr. Shifra. Now that covers business for the day. You may work quietly on whatever homework you have not finished until the bell rings. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, which horrid warning gaped wide. Finnegan, quiet. What are you doing? Homework. Mr. Shifra said we could work on homework. Silence, please. Davi, eyes front. As soon as Davi looks away, Finnegan changes into Jaden. He grins at Mr. Shifra. And this is why I sojourn here. Alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. The students turn back to look at Jaden, who has changed back into Finnegan. Finnegan, if you could practice your recitation some other time. Of course, Mr. Shifra, but I'm afraid I don't have any other homework to work on. What would you like me to do? Just sit there. Just sit, please. Is something the matter, Mr. Shifra? Finnegan, what are you doing? <clears throat> Finnegan, be quiet, or I will have to send you to the office. When everyone turns away, Finnegan changes into Laura. Are you sure that would be safe for me to go alone? She changes back to Finnegan before anyone turns. Stop! If you don't stop! Please be quiet. Finnegan, just be quiet. An uncomfortable silence falls, the kind of silence that hits any time a teacher explodes. After a moment, another teacher sticks his head in from the hallway. Is everything all right in here, Mr. Schaefer? Of course, Mr. Kirkpatrick. Just a little high energy today. Okay. But Mr. Schaefer, where's Finnegan? Finnegan is gone. Everyone looks around. The bell rings. No one moves. Blackout. Scene three. The empty playground, night. A slightly waning moon hangs high and threatening over the trees. Ethereal singing washes through the space. Shapes move in the forest. In the far distance, we hear a mother calling for her child. It has a hint of desperation to it. Otherwise, the night is empty. A police car drives by slowly, shining a spotlight through the empty playground. The light catches on a woman huddled on the edge of the forest. She is weeping quietly. After a moment, a police officer with a flashlight crosses onto the playground. Excuse me, ma'am? The weeping intensifies, but the woman neither moves nor responds. Who is that? Mrs. O'Malley? Mrs. Brennan? Something moves in the trees and the police officer shines his flashlight around, desperately searching for whatever it was. His light swings back to the woman. Ma'am, there's been another disappearance. We're currently under a curfew and need you to return to your home. Something snickers in the trees. Again, the flashlight flicks around, finding nothing. Uh, Ma'am, what are you doing out here? 
The officer steps forward, reaching for her. As he reaches, an ungodly wail rises from the woman. She turns toward the officer and begins to rise. She is hooded, and the audience cannot see what Officer Daniel sees. No, get back! He reaches around as if going for his gun, but instead pulls a horseshoe, which he waves in her face. His partner runs on. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Just run, Mike, get back in the car. What is it? Just get back in the damn car! They run, leaving the wailing woman crying on stage. Fade to blackout. Scene four, the classroom. The three empty seats are prominent. The students are taking a test, or should be. They have all either finished or were never trying. The papers before them are ignored and forgotten while they shoot each other sideways glances and whisper quietly to each other. At the head of the room, Mr. Shifra sits at his desk with his head in his hands. It is clear he has been there for a while. The bell rings and the students quietly get up to leave. Leave your tests on my desk on your way out. Students leave, except for Davi, who crosses to Schieffer's desk and waits until everyone else has left. I want to know where Finnegan is. I don't know, Davi. No one does. He was here, and then he wasn't. You were here. You know something. Why would I know anything? I don't know. Yesterday, you majorly freaked out right before Finnegan disappeared, and you took him home the night before. I took him to Mrs. Brennan's. He walked home. And the police spent half of yesterday talking to you. Yes, Davi, because he disappeared from my classroom. He was here when I took attendance. He was here when I collected homework. He was there when I yelled at him for reciting poetry throughout the entire homeroom. Then he wasn't there when Mr. Kirkpatrick came in to ask me why I was yelling at my students. You know something. Yes, that Finnegan has not been seen since yesterday morning. Why was he reciting that poem? I looked it up. It was La Belle Dame Sans Merci by John Keats. We read it last year in English. And what did you take from it? Nothing really. It was just some crap about a guy falling in love with an imaginary girl. No, Davi. It's about a knight falling for a fairy woman, then falling asleep and not waking until he was old and dying. And watch your language. But so what? It's just a stupid poem, which Finnegan did not have to recite in English class. Hell, we're reading A Wrinkle in Time, not Romantic-era poetry. What can I say, Davi? I have no idea what Finnegan was doing. I don't know where he has gone, and I don't know how to get him back. Get him back? So you think he's alive? Of course. He's... Don't of course me. I heard Mr. Marshall talking to that cop, and he said at this point, they're looking for bodies not children. And Sally Spather said something about missing children not found in the first 24 hours are almost always... We all have to hope for the best, Davi. Now go home before you miss your walking group. My mother is picking me up. And I am sure she is already waiting for you. Let's not make her more nervous, all right? I want you to get him back, Mr. Shifra. I can't. I can't do anything, Davi. You can! I can't! I'm... Sorry, Mr. Shifra. I, I thought, I, I just, I hope that... I know. I'm sorry, Davi. Go home. Davi starts to leave, leaving Shifra staring at his desk. Davi, I will do what I can. I don't know if it means anything, but I will try. Thank you, Mr. Shifra. Davi heads out again. Oh, and uh, Davi, I know it seems... well... I don't know. But when I was younger and having a hard time, this sometimes helped me. My mother used to read it to me before bed. <clears throat> I'm needed in the bus line. I will see you tomorrow. Mr. Schieffer leaves. Davi, alone in the classroom, flips through the book. Oh, I forbid you, maidens all that wear gold in your hair, to come or go by Carterhoe for young Tam Lynn is there. Tam Lynn. Janet has kilted her green kirtle a little above her knee, and she has braided her yellow hair a little above her brow, and she's away to Carter Ho as fast as she can go. 
What the hell is a curdle? Blackout. Scene 5. Lights up on a cathedral-like room filled with inhuman creatures. Jenny Greenteeth, the Lianxi, the Hinky Punk, Redcaps, Pukas, Banshees, Imps, etc. They're literally everywhere. On stage, in the audience, hang out at the light booth, everywhere. Garish colors, animal faces, horns, and wings. It's like a Brian Froud book exploded on stage. Sprawled on a throne in the far end of the room is Finnegan, or something that looks a lot like him. Mr. Shifra enters, storming through the crowd in such a way that it is obvious that he has been here before. When the not Finnegan sees him, he rises and bows mockingly. Tam, what a nice surprise. I thought you left us for good. Give him back. Who, loud? Finnegan. Give Finnegan back. The Gankana changes, taking the shape of Tam, Shifra when he was fifteen years old. Haven't we done this before? Don't. You've taken my cousin. All that time we were talking when I thought you actually wanted to be my friend. You were just using me to lure her to the woods. I went home and she wasn't there. She... You took her. And through hill and vale I come to rescue her. That's not... I didn't sound like that. I want her freed and will face you however you demand. Stop. I'll trade my life for hers. I will stay here of my own free will for seven years, if you will free her. I didn't know she was dead. The Gankana transforms, taking on a new face, a blonde girl with a sad visage. Don't you dare take that face. What? This one? Don't you dare. Remember? We used to run around the woods for hours. I was trying to escape. Not always. I didn't know she was dead. I'm sorry, pet, but you would not have stayed if you had known you were buying nothing. I thought I was saving her. I know. Now that you're back, Underhill, tell me a story. You are always so good at telling stories. I am here for Finnegan. Of course you are. Though, I am curious. Why exactly did you not come for the other two brats? Laura and Jaden. The Gankana shifts, taking on Jaden's shape. <laughs> Was it because I never turned in my first research project? I swear I did it. I just lost it somewhere. You totally didn't have to let me die for it. That's not funny, Gankana. I didn't come for them because I knew they were dead. Well, which shape would you prefer me in? Oh wait, I remember. You wanted me to give you Finnegan. He changes into Finnegan. Better? No. All right. How about this? Changes to Tam's shape. I just want you to tell me if Finnegan is alive. I just want you to tell me if my cousin is alive. Is he alive? Is she alive? Why wouldn't he be? That's not an answer. Is he alive? Why would I know? Do not pull that shit on me. Is he alive? You're always such a fun little thing. Now that you are back, maybe we don't need a new pet. So he is alive. For now. Quiet! He's alive. Unbeknownst to Shifra, another person has entered the scene. Politely, quietly, Davi is making their way through the crowd. Um, excuse me. A quiet snicker runs through the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, little one. Uh, hello. Davi! Oh, uh, hi, Mr. Shifra. Davi, go home, now! No, Mr. Shifra, I know what I'm doing. You're the one that gave me that book. What book? Tamlin. Some stupid poem about a knight who was kidnapped, I guess, by fairies. And notice that I'm not freaking out about the fact that there seems to be two of you. You're not brothers, are you? Might be. No! Alright, just, just running with it here. <clears throat> I am here to claim Finnegan and take him home. Uh, and, and Laura and Jaden too, I, I guess. Davi. Laura and Jaden are dead. But not, not Finnegan, right? I don't know that for sure. Go home. I will sort this out. The Lian Shi to Davi. So you think to come down here, true love will conquer all, and you will take the lovely Finnegan home? True love? Jesus, I'm 15! How did you get down here, little pet? I followed Mr. Shifra. The, the adult one, not, not that other one. 
Got a bit confused by the tunnel that wasn't a tunnel under the library, but I, I found it. Could you stop? Just, just stop getting so close. Davi, I am taking care of this. Go home quickly. Yes, little one. Let Tam take care of this, and I will take you home. Tam, that's, that's, what's going on? Don't worry about it, Lark. Just sit down over here, and I will take you to Finnegan as soon as Tam leaves. Davi starts to go over to the Lee and she, she for steps between them. Leave the child alone, and return Finnegan. That's quite a demand, love, without anything offered in return. What do you want? In exchange for Finnegan and this little one? Without she for noticing, Davi has crossed behind him to sit at the Lian Shi's feet. You're not worth that much, Tam. Go home. I'll call you when I need you again. Give him back! Or we could try out your little storybook ending. Tam Lin, correct? It was always your favorite story. So have the little child choose who to take home, and we'll see if they can spot their love. Isn't that what you were hoping for when you gave them that book? It's not like that, I just- Then it's settled. She claps her hands, waking Davi. Arise, little lark. Your dear teacher and I have decided, if you can find your little Finnegan, you can take him home. Why, I'll even give you your dear history teacher as well, <laughs> if you want him. What? But, but I- Find your love. Your sweetheart, and take him home. Jesus, we're just friends, and plus I- Just find Finnegan, Davi. They're going to try to fool you. Hell, they are going to fool you, but- No helping the dove, Tam. They must do it on their own. She raises a hand and shadows swarm over Shifra, pulling him down and silencing him. What? What is going on? Did you want to save your little Finnegan, dove? Well, yeah, I, I came here to- Then I will make you a deal. We like deals here in this court. Do we not? A simple deal. If you can pick your Finnegan, you can take him and return home. Safe as houses. You fail, and you belong to us. Davi is silent for a moment, thinking. Well, all right, but I don't understand. Is he Is he hiding or something? Davi trails off as more than a dozen figures in hooded robes step out from the crowd. What the hell is this? Shoes! What? Annoyed, they pull the hood off the nearest shadow. It is obviously not Finnegan, though there are some similarities. Something in the height or hair or eyes. That's not Finnegan. They try again, pulling the hood off another, finding another that is similar but not Finnegan. That's, that's not either. Where is he? Then again. What is this? Where's Finnegan? Davi runs around pulling all the hoods off all the shadows. All have something in common with Finnegan, but none are Finnegan until the last. Finn? It can't be that easy, Davi. There's always a trick. Don't be mean, Tam. Y yeah, and we're going to talk about that Tam thing later on, too. I thought your name was Michael? They turn back to the hooded figure. You look like Finnegan. What else would I look like, you moron? <laughs> you sound like Finnegan. Shouldn't that tell you I am Finnegan? Can we just go home already? So how am I supposed to know if he is Finnegan? True love, little lark. You've read the poem, The Power of True Love. Well, you guys stop saying that. We're just friends. We're just good friends. Leave it be, Davi. Just try. Okay. Okay. So, am I allowed to ask you questions? Of course you are. Why would you not be? Where have you been? Down here. After I talked to Mrs. Brennan, I ran into some creeps and ran away. I ended up in the burnout old library. I fell through some floorboards and ended up here. You were in school the next morning. What? I saw you. You spent half of homeroom reciting poetry, then you suddenly weren't there. Are you sure? I saw you. It wasn't him. It just looked like him. 
Okay, so how do I know it's you now? Don't be an idiot. It's me. Yes, but you were just saying that it wasn't you yesterday, and it certainly looked like you. How do I know that this you is you? I have no idea. Isn't it traditional to, like, ask me something only I would know or something like that? Well, what is something that only you would know? I don't know. Your mom cares way too much about white-tailed deer. <laughs> yeah, but I'm pretty sure anyone in her protest group knows that. They share an uncomfortable laugh. Davi, do you think this is him? Of course. Who else would it be? Is this your love, little lark? The shadows and fairies begin whispering, quietly urging Davi to choose. Take the Finnegan. Your Finnegan. Your choose. Finnegan. Your Finnegan. He's your Finnegan. He's yours. All over the court, creature and shadows urge them, but Davi remains silent. Come on, Davi. I want to go home. Everybody shut up. I have one more question. Why are you so calm? What? Why are you? I'm not. I'm freaking the hell out. But you are making bad jokes and talking about falling through floors as if you haven't been missing for over 24 hours and as if Jaden and Laura aren't probably dead and as if there weren't two Mr. Shifras and as if we're not completely surrounded by rejects from a Guillermo del Toro movie, both me and my very granola mother are probably having heart attacks. So why are you so calm? A mean laughter runs through the fairies. <laughs> <laughs> you are not Finnegan. But if I'm not Finnegan, who is? Finnegan, where are you? The shadows and fairies mock him, calling Finnegan, Finnegan in sing-song voices. Out of the chaos comes a very distant and desperate voice. Davi, is that you? Davi, help me! Finnegan bursts from the surrounding chaos. He is dirty, disheveled, and looks terrified. Davi, thank God! Let's get out of here! Stop! Just, just stop! What? Davi, come on! Do you think I'm an idiot? You are not Finnegan. How can you tell? I, I don't know. But I know that that is not Finnegan. Fine. I'm not. He changes, slipping into the shape of Tam right in front of Davi's face. Davi jumps back, frightened, surprised, and confused. But nor have you found your Finnegan. So what now, pet? Can I look around? Why not? I'm not so sure about some of those... things. They look dangerous. One of the creatures hiss at them, <laughs> then laughs when they jump back. <laughs> no, they will not harm you while you search. Do you promise? I swear that until you name one as Finnegan, no one will harm you. And after? If you are correct, you will be safe and free to go. If you are wrong, I make no promises. You promise that I can search however I see fit, and no one will harm me. I swear. No, wait! Then it's agreed. We did agree. The promise is binding. Do what you will. All right, then. Davi begins walking about the court, looking carefully at each creature as they pass. The Lianxi and most of the creatures look amused. The Gankana looks unsure. After a moment, Davi comes across a creature that, for whatever reason, draws their eye. Is he your choice? Not yet. Finn, I mean, you. Come here. The creature steps forward. As it does, its hood falls back, showing a creature that looks more and more like Finnegan. When it is close enough, Davi reaches out, taking its hand. It screams, losing all semblance of resembling Finnegan and falling on the floor. A bright red burn appears on its hand. Everyone in the room seems startled, even Davi. The creatures move to rush them, but the Gankana raises a hand, stopping them. What did you do, child? Davi holds up their hand. Palmed in the cup of their hand is a nail, long, squared, and too dark to be steel. Last summer, my mom insisted that my grandfather come out and modernize the barn. She was scared that all of the old nails were probably made of lead, but I remember Grandpa just kept insisting they were iron. Pure, 
iron. When he had pulled them all and replaced them, he left a can of them in my room, saying my mother was an idiot and that I might need them someday. Iron. Tam. He turns to where Shifra sits in a pile on the floor, bemused. <laughs> I told him nothing. Davi, how did you know the Fae can't touch iron? I read it in the library. The new one, not the old one that I guess we're underneath right now. Mom shut off my internet access after she found me looking at pictures of those bodies from the 70s, so when you gave me that weird poem, I had to go to the library to look it up. I asked the librarian, and she took me down into the archives. She showed me this old book called Fairy Lore. I thought it was all just, you know, a fairy tale until I found the contract. The contract? In this new library? Yeah. It was in the cage where they keep the stuff that's actually worth money, which you've probably never seen. It's down in the basement, where the beams are all exposed and wrapped in iron. I remember Jenna talking about it in her report on the new library. The interesting design feature was specifically requested by the city council when they hired the architect from Boston to do the designs. The books on mythology are in the back of the cage for some reason. When I was putting the book away, I found a box stuffed into the back of the shelf. The contract is in an iron box, in the iron cage, surrounded by iron beams. I went to ask Mr. Schieffer about it, and I saw him heading into the forest. We were close enough to my house, so I grabbed some of these iron nails and followed. They raise their hand again, showing that there are several nails tucked into the tight cuff of their shirt. I figured, better safe than sorry. Yes, Davi. A plus on your history project, by the way. So, now I guess I just shake hands with each of you until I find the one that isn't burned by the iron. Davi moves threateningly toward the Gankana, who laughs even while taking a large step back. <laughs> no need, child. He waves toward the crowd, and a figure draped in a shadow cloak falls out, suddenly released. Unsure, Davi takes a step forward and gently pulls back the hood. It is Finn again. Finn? Davi, you moron! What the hell? Why didn't you see me? I was right there! I'm sorry. Finnegan glares and immediately storms towards an exit. Shadows jump up to block him. Finnegan jumps back, terrified. Not yet, little bird. I want to go home! And you will, as soon as your true love claims you. Excuse me? I have to figure out if you're you. I'm sorry, but do you mind? They hold up a nail. Finnegan takes it from them and after, both stare at it in his hand for a moment. Davi throws their arms around him, hugging him tight. Finnegan! It's really you! Oh my god, I, I was scared you were dead! God, Davi, I'm fine. I just want to go home. Um, this, this is Finnegan. I choose him, which means we get to go home, right? It is your right. Uh, she also said we could take Mr. Shifra, right? She did. Take him for all the good it'll do you. Well, come on, Mr. Shifra, let's get out of here. They reach for the teacher to pull him to his feet, but as their hands meet, Shifra pulls back, hurt. Davi looks at their hand where an iron nail is still sticking out of the cuff of their shirt. There is silence while the two children stare at the teacher and the red wound on his hand. Mr. Shifra? Yes, Finnegan. You're not Mr. Shifra. I am. Where is the real Mr. Shifra? I am Mr. Shifra. It's not a trick. It really is me. It is. Tam Michael Shifra Kilkenny. Your dear history teacher. Your Mr. Shifra. You're not human. He's not. Never was. I'm... I'm sorry. I... Finnegan, come on, let's get out of here. But- He looks around, unsure, but fear quickly wins out. Davi takes Finnegan's hand and they run off. Left alone in the fairy court, Mr. Shifra stands across from the fairies. It seems you're ours again. But Finnegan and Davi are not. So well she minded what he did say, that young Tam Lin did win. Out then spake the queen of fairies, out of brush and broom. She that has gotten young Tam Lin has gotten a stately groom. But had I known Tam Lin, she said, what now this night I see, I would have taken out thy two gray eyes, 
and put in two of three. Blackout. Scene six. The classroom. The students sit on or around the desks, but with no semblance of order. It has the general aura of a ship without a captain. Finnegan sits on his desk with Davi lingering a protective hair too close. The students talk quietly and without much purpose. The bell rings and no one moves. After a moment, the door opens and Mr. Kirkpatrick walks in. Settle down. The students make their way slowly to their desks. Welcome back, Finnegan. And I hope you don't have any more impromptu walks in the forest planned. No, Mr. Kirkpatrick. Good. Now, Mr. Marshall would like me to keep an eye on your class today. Officer Daniels will be making one more stop by. It is just to talk to you about Mr. Schieffer's disappearance. Any information you have will be helpful, so please answer truthfully and fully. This is very important. Finnegan, I know you have already spent a lot of time talking to the police, but they would like to talk to you first. It should be short. Finnegan rises, heading for the door. On the way by, Davi grabs his hand. Are you okay, Finn? Sure. I just hope Mr. Schieffer comes back. Finnegan heads out. Davi watches him go, twisting around to follow him with a worried gaze. I just hope he's Mr. Schieffer when he does. Blackout.